Hi everyone, my name is Matt, and about two years ago I built a custom storage server using old workstation components and a bunch of hard drives shucked from external USB drives. I installed TrueNAS Core on that system and have been using it to store and centralize all my old video files that I used to just keep on a bunch of random external drives. Up until recently, this machine's been working great, but a few things changed in the past couple of weeks that have given me enough motivation and enough of an excuse to upgrade the system to better fit my current and future needs. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about what made me decide to upgrade, show you what I'm upgrading to, and bring you along for the whole journey as it ended up being much more of an adventure than I originally anticipated. But before I get any further, I do want to take a minute to talk about the sponsor of today's video, FlexiSpot. This is FlexiSpot's E7 Pro motorized standing desk that is shockingly sturdy with a weight capacity of 440 pounds. It offers a ton of different top options, including stuff like solid butcher block and real bamboo like what I have here. And unlike cheap standing desks made of light and flimsy aluminum, the E7's frame is made out of automotive grade steel and offers a dual motor design for ultra smooth movement. While this desk is new, I've personally been using a FlexiSpot standing desk as a workbench and film table for over 6 years now and it still works incredibly well. While FlexiSpot is known for their standing desks, they also have a range of desk accessories like this undermount drawer and the one I've been enjoying the most which is their C7 office chair. This office chair offers a very comfortable and ergonomic experience with a ton of adjustments and nice inclusions like a headrest and easily adjustable lumbar support which is a huge improvement over the basic office chair I used to use. Their E7 Pro desk and C7 office chair are both currently on sale right now and can be had for even even less by using my promo code on screen and down below. So make sure to head to the link in the description to grab your next setup upgrade from FlexiSpot and to support the channel. Thanks again to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video and let's get back to this storage server upgrade. So getting back into the video, let's talk about my old system and why I decided to upgrade. At the heart of this storage server is an old 4-core 8-thread E5 Xeon inside of an HP Z420 motherboard and paired with 32GB of ECC memory. For drives, it's using dual 128GB ADATA SATA SSDs for redundant boot drives and 6 14TB hard drives in a RAID Z2 configuration that I shucked from external drives. Powering the system is a 650 watt 80 plus bronze rated unit and all these parts are housed inside of a fractal design Define R4. For an operating system, I've been using TrueNAS Core and up until recently this has been working great. That is until one day when I walked into my networking room which also happens to be my laundry room and smelled the unmistakable smell of burnt electronics coming from my storage server. This combined with the fact I've been wanting to downsize this system gave me the perfect excuse to upgrade. For this upgrade, I decide to only reuse the drives and also try and use mostly parts I already had on hand along with a new case that I've had my eyes on for a few months. But before I could do anything, I needed to figure out what was wrong with my current server as trying to turn it on resulted in the fan spinning for a second and then stopping. This made me believe it was a power supply or motherboard issue so I decided to try a different power supply as that would be the much easier thing to test. Plugging in a different power supply and then turning on the system did result in it booting which was great to see and it did boot into TrueNAS. With that being said, going into the web interface showed that the storage pool was degraded and one of the drives was not being recognized. Which even after replugging all the drives was still not showing up so I decided to pull them all out and really make sure they all had good connections. Thankfully, this resulted in the storage pool showing up as fully online with zero errors. Now at this point, I could have just installed a new PSU and been back up and running, but I've been wanting to move to a smaller, more powerful, and more power efficient system for a while now, so I still decided to proceed with the upgrade. Now other than the drives from the system, I'm basically replacing everything, so let's talk about all the parts that are going into my new upgraded storage server. So first I want to talk about the case as this was one of the only parts purchased new for the system and dictated a number of other selections for the build. This is the Johnsbow N4 and ever since I heard about it a few months back, I knew this would be my new server case. It's super compact, especially compared to my last one, and it fits all the hardware I'm wanting to use very well. For drive support, it allows for 6 3.5 inch drives, which is exactly what I have, along with 2 SATA SSDs, which is again exactly what I have. It supports a micro ATX motherboard, so it will allow for moderate amounts of PCIe expansion, but it is using a half height design, so no full height cards. 
Also, this only supports an SFX power supply and only has a single 120mm exhaust fan at the back for the drives. Cooling is a slight concern, but we'll see how that works out once the system is built. But overall, for the size and for my needs, I think this will work out very well. Plus, I really like the wood accent, which on mine unfortunately did come with a minor defect. Also, if you don't like the white color, they also make a black version, which I'll link down below along with all the other parts mentioned in this video. So now let's talk about all the parts I'm going to put into this case. For the CPU, I wanted something relatively modern as this would allow the system to have much better single threaded performance and depending on the CPU picked, allow for lower power consumption. After seeing what I had on hand and weighing my options, I decided on going with the Intel Core i5-12400. This is a 6 core 12 thread CPU that's actually over 2.5 years old now, with that being said this offers plenty of single and multi thread performance which will allow me to do a ton of things with my new server while also keeping the power draw to a minimum. Now one great thing about the CPU for a server build like this one is the fact it has integrated graphics. The iGPU on this chip will be great for not just setting up and troubleshooting the system, but can also be used for video transcoding and media streaming applications like Plex and Jellyfin which is something I'd like to play around with. To cool the CPU, I'm going to start out by just using the included stock cooler as this will likely be enough, but I do have some ideas if I need to go the aftermarket route in the future. For the motherboard, I went with something that may seem like an odd pick, but was the best compatible board I had on hand for this project that met all my needs, which is the Gigabyte B660M Aorus Elite AX. This board offers 4 DIMM slots, 2 NVMe M.2 slots, and 2 16x PCIe slots with the bottom one being 4x electrically. The back panel AO is great including stuff like 2.5 gigabit ethernet, but unfortunately I won't really be using any of it. One downside of this board and most modern motherboards is the fact it does only have 4 SATA ports, meaning I will have to add some sort of SATA expansion device. For RAM, I'm just going to start out with a 32GB kit of G-Scale RipJaws 5 DDR4 memory at 3200MHz. 32GB should be enough to start out with, but I can always pop in two more 16GB sticks in the future for 64 total, which I might end up doing sooner rather than later because DDR4 is basically the cheapest it's ever been right now. Also to address the elephant in the room, yes this is not ECC memory, but I think it'll be fine. Using ECC memory on a home server is a pretty polarizing topic, with some people claiming it's completely unnecessary, while others saying it's the worst thing you could possibly do, so I decided to see for myself, but I'd love to hear your guys thoughts on this in the comments below. My motherboard has a fair amount of PCIe expansion, so let's talk about how I'm going to use it. In the top M.2 slot, I decided to install a random 500GB NVMe SSD I had on hand to use as a cache drive, which I'll talk more about how that works towards the end of the video. This drive is a WD Blue SN570, which isn't the fastest drive ever or anything, but should work okay as a cache drive. With that being said, it may be a good idea for me to eventually swap this out for something with higher write endurance. As for the other M.2 slot, I decided to try out one of these M.2 to SATA adapters to give me more SATA ports so that I can use all the drives from my previous system. This uses a pretty common and well supported Asmedia SATA controller and I've seen a number of other people use this adapter, so I was hopeful this would work well for my needs, but you'll see how that worked out in a minute. In the bottom 16x slot, which again is 4x electrically, I decided I'd use a networking card. See this motherboard does have 2.5 gigabit networking built in, but I wanted to make this system 10 gig compatible, so I hopped onto eBay and purchased a Mellanox Connect X3 10 gigabit adapter which uses a 4x connector and comes with both a full and half height bracket. This card uses an SFP plus connector which is a lot different from the more common RJ45 connector that I'm used to, which is good as my new switch does have dual 10 gigabit SFP plus ports, one of which I will use for this server. To power this system, I'm using the 650 watt EVGA Supernova power supply which comes in the small SFX form factor and is 80 plus gold rated. This is probably a fair bit overkill for this build, but again I was mostly using stuff I had on hand and this was the best fit I had available. It's fully modular, well rated and will have no problem whatsoever powering this build. As for drives, I again am going to reuse all the ones from my previous build, which includes two 120GB ADATA SU800 SATA SSDs, 
four redundant boot drives, and the six 14TB Western Digital hard drives that I pulled out of WD external drives. From what I can tell, these are white label versions of WD Red Plus drives, which is great because those are specifically meant for NAS use, and chucking drives allowed me to save hundreds of dollars compared to just buying those WD Reds themselves. Also, if you're wondering about cost, again, I use mostly parts on hand, but to build a very similar system new, it would be a little over $600 without hard drives, and could be even less if you're willing to search for used deals. So now that you know about all the hardware going into my new storage server, let's talk about the process of both building the system itself and moving everything over. The first thing I had to do was prep the old server for having the drives removed and for transitioning to the new build. The first thing I did was make sure anything important on the server was for sure backed up in other places, as while well, moving these drives to a new system is unlikely to result in data loss, it's not completely out of the realm of possibilities. With that done, I went into TrueNAS and downloaded the config file, which I wasn't 100% sure if I was going to use, but again, better safe than sorry. Next, I went ahead and exported the storage pool from TrueNAS, shut the system down, and then was ready to remove the drives. Now it's time to put everything together. I started by installing the CPU into the motherboard, followed by the two 16GB sticks of RAM, then I went ahead and installed the SSD cache drive in the top M.2 slot, and then added the SATA to M.2 adapter in the bottom M.2 slot. Then I prepped the case by removing the top panel along with the bottom power supply panel, bottom fan panel, and the front magnetically attached panel, giving me access to the drive bays. One of the weird and not so great things about this case is the fact that only four of the six three and a quarter inch drive slots use a backplane that the drives plug directly into. It makes sense the SSD bays don't have a backplane because they're recessed to fit the power supply, but not having all six hard drives easily swappable with a backplane is a weird compromise that Johnsbo made. To prep the drives for installation, I had to install the rubber soft mount pieces on the connector side and the rubber mount pieces with handles on the other side. I did this for all six hard drives and installed the rubber pieces needed for the SSDs. I next went ahead and slid in all the drives into their respective drive slots and moved my attention to the motherboard compartment. I next put in the motherboard with the SATA cables attached as they were easier to install with the board out of the case because of their orientation. Then I went to install and route down the power supply cables, which I ended up needing a 24 pin extension to fit because this SFX power supply, like many, uses pretty short cables, and this case requires you to route the cables in kind of an odd way. Then I just continued to route cables, installed the networking card, and plugged everything in. With all the parts in, I decided to see if it would boot into the existing install of TrueNAS Core and would recognize all the hardware before I did a fresh OS installation. Booting the PC up, the first thing I noticed was the CPU fan wasn't spinning, and after looking at it, I realized there was a random screw stuck in the fan blade, and after pulling it out, I also noticed the display output was looking very not good to say the least. Power cycling the PC did allow it to boot into TrueNAS, but then I realized TrueNAS Core doesn't support the built-in motherboard network interface, so I had to move my operation to the laundry room where my networking is. This did allow me to get back into TrueNAS, and I actually ended up re-importing the storage pool, but only 5 of the 6 hard drives were showing up, so I checked and re-secured all the SATA data and power cables, and went back to TrueNAS to find there was still a drive not being recognized. And after checking all the connections one more time, and hopping back into TrueNAS, now the system wasn't recognizing the storage pool at all, which was definitely frustrating. After looking at the system and thinking about it for a bit, I realized that when plugging and unplugging SATA cables from the M.2 adapter, the PCB was bending a lot, and the connectors were kind of awkward to grab, and had a fit, meaning I had to use more force than ideal. So what I think happened was I straight up killed this adapter within an hour or so of it being installed. So instead of trying another one of those M.2 adapters, I decided to grab this more traditional 4X SATA card that provides 4 SATA connectors and that I just installed into the top slot for now. With that being said, in the future I can move this to an M.2 to X4 PCIe adapter if I do want to use that top slot for a graphics card or other bandwidth hungry PCIe device. With all that in, I replugged everything, and after a little more troubleshooting, the system finally recognized all the drives again, so at this point I exported the pool for the final time to get ready for the fresh OS install. 
At this point, I had an important decision to make. I knew I wanted to stick with TrueNAS as my base operating system, but I had to decide if I wanted to go with TrueNAS Core, which is what I've been using, or TrueNAS Scale. Basically, Core is the more mature, stable, and higher performance option based on FreeBSD, but Scale gives you way more capabilities because it's based on Linux. Now the performance aspect is something I want to hone in on for a second because based on Lawrence Systems testing, he found in certain data transfer tests Core was around twice as fast as Scale. With that being said, jumping between Core and Scale is pretty safe and easy to do, so I decided to try out Scale as that would give me more options to play around with. I'm not going to go into full detail about how to install TrueNAS in this video, but we'll go over the basic steps I went through and we'll link a more in-depth tutorial on installing TrueNAS Scale in the description by someone who knows way more about what they're talking about. So after downloading it from the TrueNAS website, I went ahead and flashed it to a USB drive using Bolina Etcher, then I plugged the installer drive into my new server and selected a boot to it in the BIOS. Then I selected to install TrueNAS on the two SATA SSDs, made a password, and let the installer do its thing. Once installed, I shut the system down, removed the installer drive, and turned it back on, allowing the system to boot into the fresh install of TrueNAS scale. Then from my computer, I signed into the web interface, imported the storage pool, and uploaded the config file I downloaded from the old machine. This did require me to reconfigure the network interface IP, but once that was done and I remapped my network drive, I was able to test out a file transfer. I was disappointed at first to see the transfer speed top out around 280-ish megabytes per second, but then I remembered that my PC is currently only connected with 2.5 gigabit, which it seems to be maxing out. With that being said, I am very excited to see transfer speeds once I have both systems hooked up to 10 gigabit. At this point, the server build is done for now, especially on the hardware side, but on the software side, I have a ton I want to do. Things I want to try out are 1. Hosting my own media files with a service like Plex or Jellyfin. I also want to try out hosting some game servers for games like Minecraft and Valheim, and see if this PC can handle those well, as my last system struggled a bit hosting a vanilla Minecraft server, which shouldn't be a problem anymore. One other thing I want to do is try making a games cache for my most common benchmarking titles, that way I won't have to wait to download all the games for each new system that I'm testing, which would be a big time save. Another thing I want to play around with is home automation stuff, along with doing local and automatic backups of my smartphone. I'm not going to be doing that stuff in this video, but if you'd like to see a dedicated video on me trying to figure out and set up all that stuff, then let me know in the comments below. So with all the hardware installed and the system set up and running, I'm happy with how it turned out and how it's performing so far. I now have a much more compact system with the same amount of storage and more powerful and power efficient hardware. In terms of power draw, currently at idle, this system is pulling about 63 watts from the wall, and while writing data to the pool, this system pulls about 93 watts. I unfortunately didn't think to grab power usage for the old system, but I have to imagine it was at least a little bit higher. So in terms of cost to run the server, at the 63 watt idle power running 24 hours a day equates to a little over $5.5 a month for me, or about $68 a year. Now it's important to also note that the majority of this power draw is from the hard drives, and using fewer of them or all SATA SSDs would cut down on the power usage by a significant margin. In terms of temps, under a light load like a file transfer, the CPU stays in the mid to upper 40s, which seems okay, but I'm interested to see how high temps are under a more full load. Also, I forgot to mention, I threw in a random 80mm knock to a fan near the SATA and networking cards to try and give them a little more active airflow. In terms of drive temps, the highest I saw any of them get was about 49 degrees, which is well within the rated operating temps for these drives, and I think it's acceptable for me. Overall, I'm definitely happy with how this server turned out, and I'm excited to start playing around and learning more about the software side of things. With that being said, I'm interested to hear what you guys think of this build in the comments below. Would you have done something different, or do you think this is a solid configuration? Let me know, as I'm still definitely a server noob, so any advice would be greatly appreciated. Thanks again to FlexiSpot for sponsoring this video, and make sure to check them out in the links in the description. Also, YouTube may compensate me for using the shopping tags in this video. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.